Welcome to episode one of Going All In, Get the Edge You Need to Succeed. And my name is Dr. Erin McKinley, and I am the creator of this podcast. And I thought it would be a really great idea to kick off this podcast with a little bit of background about who I am. So some of you listening may have no idea who I am and why I've created this podcast and what qualifies me to speak on these matters that will be discussed across episodes of this podcast. So I want to go back and just give a little insight on my journey to where I am today. And I've also asked some of my students to send me some questions that I'm going to throw in uh, throughout my little chat today. So hey, that's me. Dr. Erin McKinley. So currently, I am the Didactic Program in Dietetics Director at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I've been here about two and a half years. I'm also a registered and licensed dietitian, as well as a certified lactation consultant and a certified health education specialist. So I have a ton of letters after my name. My husband likes to make fun of me that if I get any more credentials, they won't be able to fit on a business card. So maybe I should pump the brakes on that. But I think credentials are fun. We'll talk about credentials in this podcast. Among many other things related to career professional success, personal success, development in those areas. And I've done and seen a lot in my life so far, and I've been able to observe people in leadership roles, both good and bad. That has taught me a lot and has molded a lot of my leadership style And I'm a career changer, as we call that in the world of of dietetics, where I had a whole other career in something completely different than nutrition before deciding to go back to school and pursue that. But everything I've done throughout this entire time has taught me skills and given me life lessons that I therefore like to put into my current work so that my students can benefit from that. So this podcast mainly focuses on the profession of dietetics and preparing students who are currently studying nutrition and dietetics at either an undergraduate or graduate level or they're currently dietetic interns to help them be successful since that is the industry and the profession that I am currently in. But There will be a lot of episodes that just have really good career advice that could be beneficial to those not necessarily working in dietetics. So I encourage viewers to be checking out the episodes just to kind of see what it's about that particular week. To kick off this first few months of the podcast, I'm mainly focusing on doing spotlight sessions with dietetic internships. So COVID has created a situation where we're not able to get together and have these group gatherings. So fall is usually a very popular time in our world of internships holding open houses, uh, schools and companies having internship fairs, uh, very large conferences occurring where there might be an internship fair. And there's usually just a lot of opportunity for students to get exposed to meeting directors, 
getting information about programs, and getting their questions answered. So with being virtual this fall, I wanted to make sure that my students and then other students across the U.S. who are also studying dietetics, that students still had an opportunity to have that type of experience of getting personal with a program and getting to know a director and asking questions and really seeing if that program is the right fit for them, if they want to possibly apply there in the future. I wanted to be able to create that experience for students. So I thought the best route to go about that would be to create a podcast so that each week there's a different program that's being focused on where my students can tune in live and other students that have been invited can tune into the live session to get their questions answered and kind of get a little bit of exposure to that director and then post them on YouTube so that both the program can benefit from some free advertising, so to speak, and other students across the country and maybe across the world if they're um, eligible to come to the U.S. to do internships to get that information out as well. We are definitely moving as a society in this direction of just having even more things virtual and accessible online than ever before. And I think it's just really crucial right now to be staying connected as much as we can. So a lot of these episodes over the next couple of months are really going to be focused on that. But I do have some some open time where I plan to to bring in people that I know that do an array of interesting things in their own careers that can provide some pretty basic and general career advice, career advice or success advice that may be beneficial to both students who are studying dietetics and others in general. So like I said, I asked my students to send me some questions and I took all of them and and didn't uh, think anything of it when I was copying and pasting them on the sheet in front of me. And I sort of looked them over so that I could put them in a logical order so that the history of uh, Aaron McKinley would make a little bit of sense. So the first question is, what were you like when you were younger? Have you always been the way you are now? And now that I'm reading this question, I'm like, wait, what do you mean? What, how the way I am now? Is that good? Is that bad? I'll take it as good and interesting. So have I always been the way I am now? I would say yes and no. It just depends on what we're talking about. So I am originally from Rhode Island. I am not from the South or from Louisiana. A lot of folks assume that, but I definitely do not have any type of accent that indicates where I would be from. So I am from Rhode Island, but I do not have the accent that goes with that. If I am around individuals that are from New England, After a while, I will start to pick up a little bit of an accent, or if I'm speaking too fast and I'm in a hurry, it tends to to come out a little bit. So I was born in Woonsocket and grew up in Manville, Rhode Island, which is, is just immediately next to that city. I grew up in a town that consisted of mill villages. So I grew up in Lincoln. I went to Lincoln High School. But I grew up in Manville, which is the northern most part of that little town. And that's actually the house that I grew up in. It looks like a really giant house, but it's actually two apartments um, that each take over an entire floor and then an entire full attic that makes a third floor. And an entire full basement that actually makes a fourth floor if you go down. Um, My parents owned this house. They bought it from my father's parents. So I have a very French Canadian family. So my meme and my pepe. And they lived on the first floor and we lived on the second floor. And this picture was taken well after my parents had sold this house and moved to Las Vegas. So 
it looks a little bit different than when I was living in that house. And you can't see it from this picture, but there's two backyards. So there's like a, an immediate backyard behind it where there's clothing li like clothing lines uh, to hang laundry. And then there's a huge backyard uh, beyond that. So grew up in a town that was a little bit of a mix between low income all the way up to very high income. So it was a very interesting um, environment to be in when I was in high school. Just a, a mix of students, but it wasn't very diverse otherwise uh, compared to other areas um, in Rhode Island. Like one, two blocks over is one socket, which is a very diverse area of Rhode Island. And then Manville tends to be very French Canadian, uh, Scotch Irish, Irish Catholic, especially in the area that I grew up in, everyone was Catholic. So that's me in kindergarten. Uh, I definitely had a mullet because I have naturally curly hair and I don't think my mother knew what to do with it. So I look like Laura Ingalls in this picture. And um, after the, the mullet went away, I had short hair for quite a while until maybe high school when I started growing it out and I had this little like really poofy afro-like looking hair that people would make fun of a lot but in like they said the best way they thought it was cool but I did not interpret it that way in that picture the black and white picture that's my older sister Emily <clears throat> she's three and a half years older than I am and she currently lives in Utah with her family and my parents currently live in Las Vegas, but they are in the midst of moving into their new house in South Carolina. So I did fairly well in school when I was younger. I had, um, I guess done well enough to be in the honors program in middle school. And then when I got into high school, I think I was only in the honors program my freshman year, and that was my first experience with encountering individuals that didn't necessarily want to be supportive of you in your educational pursuits. <clears throat> so the person that actually ran the honors program was the son of my guidance counselor, and they were they both had this really similar attitude towards females where they just didn't really care what we wanted to do if we said we wanted to go off to Ivy League universities or, or other institutions and get a college education, it was looked upon as if we were doing something wrong. Um, so this was the, the late 90s and it definitely was before a time where we were a little bit more liberated with our educational pursuits. Um, so encountering that, that annoyed me. Um, and I think that was maybe the, my first my first realization that I wasn't going to put up with that type of attitude in general. And I definitely wasn't going to put up with being made to feel like I wasn't good enough or that I was going to be held back because I was a woman. I was not a big fan of that. And that has continued throughout my life. So I ended up dropping out of the honors program because I wasn't doing very well. And sophomore year, I had come in contact with an, an instructor I cannot remember her name to save my life right now, but she was the first person who really asked me what I wanted to do. And I had lofty dreams at that time, but I hadn't done that well my freshman year. So I was already kind of behind, so to speak, to be able to apply to some of the universities that I wanted to go to. She was the first person to be like, no, like, if this is what you want to do, you can turn things around. Like you're a really good student. You just have to focus. You just need somebody to, to make sure that they're keeping up with you. And that was the first time I was like, oh, wow. So this is what positive encouragement actually feels like. And I still remember it to this day because it really did turn things around for me to where I believe from that point forward, I maybe got all A's throughout high school, probably not in math, but I did really well. And out of the 211 students that I graduated high school with, I think I was number 30, 
32 or 33. So that's pretty good. I went to a really good high school where it was extremely competitive uh, among students to, to do very well. And a lot of my peers that were maybe like top 10 amongst all of us went to Ivy League institutions and very prominent institutions like Stanford and Brown and, and things like that. And I remember applying for school. I had always had dreams of going to Brown University, but um, decided that I wanted to take a different route. And I knew I didn't want to stay in Rhode Island. That was my big thing. I wanted to get out. So all of the schools I applied to were out of state. And actually UNLV in Las Vegas was my safety school. And so my very not encouraging guidance, guidance counselor was like, oh, you got to have a safety school in state. And I went, yeah, it's in Nevada. And he just kind of rolled his eyes. So my sister went to UNLV. So that was why that that was my chosen safety school at the time, because I knew I could get in and I knew my sister was there. So if anything had happened, I could just go out there. So why, I have another question from a student, why did you choose your undergrad institution and the program that you did and not go into dietetics right away? Well, honestly, I didn't know what dietetics was back then. I was really into health and wellness in my own weird way, but I didn't know you could make a career out of it at that time. I really, I really didn't. I don't think I had ever encountered a dietitian before or had seen one on television the only kind of health and wellness things I was seeing on TV were more fitness related. So in the 90s, it was all about putting fitness on television and selling VHS tapes. So that's what I was used to. But I never encountered anybody that was on the nutrition side. So I had applied to a lot of schools just for some variety. I think I got into every school that I had applied to. But I got into Methodist college at the time. It's called Methodist University now. It's in Fayetteville, North Carolina. This was the first school I applied to and the first one that I got into. And I took that as a sign that that was probably the direction that I needed to go in at the time. I, By senior year, I went from wanting to be a scientist. I wanted to be a genetis, genetic, geneticist. Yeah, that's the right word. At Brown uh, to going more in a communications realm in mass communications and media publications. I wanted to work for a magazine and write for a magazine. So that's mainly what I was looking for in programs. And I definitely didn't, I did not approach the looking for a college to apply to, to go to from the standpoint of, Let's make sure I go somewhere that has a really great program in what I want to do. I didn't have that mindset at all. It was it's it was more where do I want to go and then I'll figure out if I like their program or not. And now that I am older and work in academia and encounter high school students, I have the exact opposite advice. It's like find out what you want to do and then find the best program for what you want to do because that's going to set you up. Uh, but for myself, I just wanted to go somewhere that felt comfortable for me, and then I would figure it out from there. So I went to visit uh, Methodist spring of my senior year, and this is a very small school. It's a D3 sports institution. It, at that time, only had about 2,000 students that went to the entire 2,000 total that went to the school and about 800 that lived on campus. And for whatever reason at that time, I just felt like the warm and fuzzies about that. And that's what I wanted. I didn't want big university. I wanted small. I wanted small class sizes. I wanted more attention from my instructors. They had, at the time, I didn't know how to judge a good or a bad communications program at that time. So I was like, ah, oh, this seems like a decent program. Let's go after that. And it wasn't in Rhode Island and North Carolina was just so pretty and the people I was uh, meeting were so nice and I just felt very welcomed on that campus and I just, it, everything just felt right. So I didn't go and visit any other school that I had uh, gotten admission to and just decided to go to North Carolina. 
My other reasons for maybe not going to the safety school was as my sister was getting older, I didn't want to be around her um, and her friends partying, being like upperclassmen and, and partying all the time. I was like, I have to be good. I, I don't want to be around people partying. And Methodist is actually a dry campus. And they enforced that very well on campus. They didn't do so well off campus. Uh, so I knew that if there were certain rules in place, maybe that would help stop me from turning into the partying college kid. So I went to Methodist. I started my first semester in communications and immediately just wasn't vibing with that program. I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't vibing with the faculty. It just wasn't right. I had gotten a student worker job working with the women's lacrosse team, which back in 2001, 2002, that was their first season as a, as a team um, competing for real. So I had gotten looped in with that because all the girls that lived on my floor were on the lacrosse team. And they're like, hey, we need a team manager. We need someone to help with recruiting and to be just helping us with things. And I was like, okay, sure. I need a, I need a campus job. So why not? And I decided to change to marketing business and marketing solely based off of the, the people that I was hanging around with at the time, they were all business majors and they just made it seem very appealing. And Methodist has a really great hospitality management program. And the more I thought about it, I was like, well, you know, I know in the next couple of years, my parents are going to be permanently moving out to Vegas. So maybe it's a good idea to be thinking about going in the hospitality realm, because that's probably where I will end up after I graduate. So I immediately changed my major and started in marketing my freshman year and then decided to add the business major on top of that because I really only had to take like three extra classes to double major. So I ended up graduating from Methodist in three and a half years as opposed to four. So I, uh, December of 2004 uh, was when I finished. And it, on these pictures, I was recently awarded in 2019 the Distinguished Alumni Award, which is the highest award given to an alumni by the Alumni Association of Methodist. I was super excited to get that award. I got to go down there and see people I haven't seen in a long time and get that award and um, made the mistake of not prepping my speech in advance. So I'm a prepper when it comes to performance things like speeches and talks and and things like that. I like to make sure that I at least have some bullet points to kind of keep me rolling through whatever it is I'm going to say. But for whatever reason, I was like, oh, I'm not going to plan to have a speech. And I ended up getting up there and crying because I was just so overcome with emotion because driving around campus the day before this award ceremony, that same warm and fuzzy feeling that I got when I first stepped on campus all those years prior, almost 20 years prior, what came back to me almost immediately. And I was just super overwhelmed by that. And I was like fighting through tears and, and talking about how I had such an amazing experience and I got such a great degree, even though I do something completely different than what I had intended to do. Um, and I think those that were in the audience were actually like more impressed by that <laughs> than if I had prepped a speech from uh, full out that would have been maybe a little bit boring. They were just like, oh, your raw emotion is just so inspiring. I was like, okay, that was kind of embarrassing. Um, but I thank Methodist for being there for me and for giving me that award. And now I'm on the Alumni Association to help them make sure that they are creating even more classes of successful grads uh, like myself. All right, moving on with my questions. What were you doing before you went back to school to become an RD? I was in Vegas, baby. <laughs> so of course, going into business school and in marketing school, I didn't 
make it through the hospitality program for certain reasons, but every class that I was taking in business school, every example that we used was something hospitality related. So I still got a really good experience from that. And when I graduated, I moved out to Vegas with my parents. They were out there full time at that point um, in early 2005 and was very naive to the fact that if you just have a bachelor's degree and you don't really have experience doing anything, um, the doors don't open very quickly for you. So I was applying to a lot of casino jobs and maybe getting like a phone interview or getting an interview and then whoever was interviewing me immediately finding out that I did not have any actual experience working in a casino. And I kept getting the same message of, well, if you want to work in the casino business, you have to get experience. And my response was, how am I supposed to get experience if you won't hire me? So I had to kind of be creative and I actually went into banking and I was a bank teller for the first year that I was there. And what that taught me was the ability to count money and count a large amount of money in a very efficient way. So it's very comfortable with money. And that's, that helped. So I parlayed that into then moving into the casino business, working in the casino cages, which are where you cash in your tickets and your, um, your chips for cash. So I was able to use my money counting skills in that and then getting exposure to working with chips and dollar amount coins in the counting system and the accounting system, um, the player management system. And then you're in that cage staring at the casino floor almost your whole shift and just people watching and watching what others are doing and watching what managers are doing. So it was a really good opportunity. And then I moved into other casinos until I landed in 2000, early 2007 at Fitzgerald's uh, Hotel Casino, which is was uh, in downtown Las Vegas. It is now called The D and is a very popular Derek Stevens uh, property. Uh, but when I got there, I started as the marketing coordinator. So there's a picture of me sitting at a desk looking shocked or confused. That was pretty much me the whole time. <laughs> so I worked with special events, doing a lot of the um, kind of the busy work of special events, invites, table cards, flyers, name tags, getting set up for these events, tearing down the events, uh, getting set up for slot tournaments, getting set up for um, banquets and things of that nature. So I did that for a short period of time because in the casino business, people are moving positions, uh, going from one job to another within the same organization or into going off to other in, um, properties very quickly. Um, so I was really only in that position for, I think, three or four months before I was asked to fill in for the assistant. It was the assistant to the GM. She was going on vacation for like two weeks, and they asked me to fill in for her since he needed somebody to be answering his telephone, taking his messages, doing all of that stuff. And... After a week of doing that, I still had a week left of covering for her. He offered me her job because I had, I, unbeknownst to me, um, she was taking that vacation because when she was coming back from that vacation, she was taking a different job in our organization. So she was moving up and out of that office. So I then moved into the office of the general manager. And technically, I was his administrative assistant at first, uh, doing all of the things that you would expect. But then a lot of Different things started coming my way that were marketing related, operations related, gaming related that I started doing more and more than what that position had really required me to because I was just good at it. So things that they would have given to somebody in a different area of management on the property, they just gave to me instead. So my boss changed my title from marketing coordinator to executive marketing coordinator, and that turned into executive operations coordinator um, later on when the GM of that property, he became the COO of the entire corporation. 
So I went from dealing with one property to dealing with five properties um, in all across the U.S. So I became um, a corporate executive <laughs> operations uh, person. So pretty much I have on here 24-7 casino life because I literally worked 24 hours a day. If I wasn't at the casino doing my job, I was at an event representing my property. I was dealing with union uh, reps. I was dealing with HR. I was dealing with everything. And you'll notice none of these pictures I have like a fancy suit on, which is what I usually wore. I was still doing a lot of fun stuff uh, on the event side, entertaining people, the microphone. That's where I really got into being an MC at events and, and being very comfortable in front of audiences and speaking, which really helped me out. Um, I would fill in when we didn't have showgirls available. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, at, at one point in between uh, trying to get into the casino business, I actually went into modeling for a short period of time. And so I felt really comfortable being put into costumes and to cute outfits. So whenever the showgirls would call in sick, I'd be like, I'll do it. I'll do it. Uh, just just for fun, just to, to break up whatever it was I was doing that day. Uh, so through this job, I got to experience a lot of really, really interesting things. Um, this was during the the 2008-2009 recession. So the vibe in the casino business right now is very similar to what it was um, when I was working in it, where there was just a lot of uncertainty. So back then, it was we were still open and operating, except people weren't coming in the door because they didn't have money to spend. So therefore, we had to be closing restaurants certain days and not having as many tables open and not having as many individuals working. And then people started getting laid off. And I would always say, like, I, I never knew when my key was going to stop working for my office door. So I was always paranoid that I was going to be next on the chopping block, even though as people were getting laid off, I was absorbing their responsibilities. So I thought maybe that was my form of job security, but it wasn't. Um, so I wanted to, during this time, really figure out, okay, what can I be doing next that will help me in if this casino thing doesn't work out and I end up having to leave because of the recession. So started looking into things, at that time, I was working with an herbalist just for my own health reasons, and I took enough law classes in business school to really wonder if the advice that this, well, several of these people were giving me was actually legal, and were they allowed to be giving this, dispensing this advice? So I started looking into it, and then that's when I discovered what registered dietitians do. And I was like, wow, that's exactly what I want to do, except I want to make sure I'm legitimate. I don't want to get sued and I want to make sure I have the right education and the right background to be able to help people with nutrition if that it does include um, integrative medicine or not. At that time, I didn't really understand what that was either. So I was kind of learning about all of these things. And my big thing was I didn't want to go back to school and get another bachelor's degree. I wanted to get a master's degree. So I had found oops, the University of Alabama. They had an online program, or they have an online program. And I had applied to that and got a phone call from the person who ran the whole program, and they were like, what? like they had no idea where I had come from. They were like, you don't really have the educational background to just go from business and marketing into a science-based major. I also didn't understand the process to become a dietitian. So I didn't know what I was getting into when I had applied to that program. So the way that Alabama's program is set up is that they have their DPD undergrad program and then they have a coordinated program where students in their junior year apply to the internship and then finish, start the internship their junior year and they finish it throughout their senior year so that when they walk across the stage with their bachelor's degree, they also have their internship done and they're ready to go take the RD exam. So they did not have it set up for a student who was doing their master's to do that. So I had to work on my master's and then go back and take all of the DPD undergrad knowledge component classes at the same time. So this whole process 
took me three and a half years from start to finish. I had to move to Tuscaloosa. It was just a lot easier instead of trying to take my science classes randomly at community colleges in Las Vegas and try to transfer them in. It wasn't as easy um, as there as it is other places. So I picked up my life and moved to Tuscaloosa. And that's what I focused on and took my classes. I got a job. I was a research assistant for many of those years um, doing data collection for research studies over the phone. The whole, would you like to take a survey? Um, so that helps with my ability to work through selling somebody on a, on a research uh, a research study to get them to participate and then going through the informed consent process over the phone, which is always interesting. Ta learned a lot about that. But then I remember when I got to Tuscaloosa, someone asked, I was just asking around, like, what's the biggest thing in town? And everyone's like, oh, duh, football. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I saw this ad in the student newspaper about how the stadium, Bryant Denny Stadium, they were looking for students to help work game days. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. So I applied. And when I went to interview and that picture with my hair down, um, with the, the curly hair, that picture was taken at that interview. They were like, where did you come from? Like you have all of these years of experience in hospitality. Like, what are you doing here? Explained what, what I was doing, that I was changing my career and, and whatnot. And um, was definitely like immediately hired for that job. So the first season I was in charge of the South side skybox gate. So all of the folks coming in through their private gate to go up to their skyboxes. And then that was 2011. So that was the famous LSU Alabama season where LSU had won that game. And they were one in Alabama and LSU were one and two in the rankings. And a ton of celebrities came to that game. And that was one of those things where it was like, Erin can handle the celebrities because she doesn't, I don't react to celebrities um, in a like shocked way. I'm just like, okay, hi. So to had to deal with a lot of celebrities um, at some of those games. So that was the first year. And then the second year I got promoted up to stadium club manager. So I had an entire level of a hospitality area. That was my responsibility every game day. Uh, game days, you work from like six in the morning till midnight at night, just making sure that everything is perfect and that your providing the best hospitality possible. So I did that all throughout my master's and then the first year of my PhD. So I became an intern in 2012. So I, the first time I applied to Alabama's program, I did not get in because I was kind of a jerk face and I would um, not talk back to my instructors, but there was one where if she made a mistake of any kind, I just pointed, I would, pointed out to her, like, oh, you made a mistake on this exam question. You gave it, you know, you marked the wrong answer, the right answer incorrect or, or whatever. And um, the poor girl was a TA, a PhD student, you know, that was just TAing and teaching her cl first class on her own that year. And she just felt super uncomfortable with me calling her out all the time, even though I wasn't doing it to be mean. I would, that's just me. I was like, hey, this is wrong. Can you fix it? And so when the time came, when my application came across the table for their internship, um, they were like, yeah, maybe Erin needs a little bit more time just to kind of like slow her roll and really figure out like what she wants to do. So I applied again in the spring, got it in the spring and started my internship in May of 2012. And I finished it in June of 2013. So there's me with my white coat and my, my name tag. And I have another question about that internship. So what aspect of your internship did you find to be the hardest? I didn't particularly find any part necessarily difficult other than the fact that you are just on your feet doing a lot of long hours, especially in your food service. In my food service rotations, I felt like I was on my feet a lot um, running all over the place. And um, when you're an intern, people don't react to you the same way they would react to their supervisor. But when you're in a management rotation in your internship, you're essentially mimicking anything that the 
the supervisor that's on duty that day is doing and then you have people looking at you like why is this little girl telling me telling me what to do so that was a little nerve-wracking because I get I still tend to get shy around people when I just don't want to throw them off so these when you go into a hospital and you go on tray line those people have been doing that job for a really long time and they're really really good at it and if you mess them up by like a millisecond they're going to call you out and so that was a little nerve-wracking at first and, and then once they got used to me I was able to do both of my food service rotations in the same hospital so that sort of helped with all of that um, another question that I received was there something you feel like you missed out on during your internship I didn't get to work so for my community rotation I didn't get to work in a WIC office I was supposed to I was supposed to be placed in the Jefferson County WIC office in Birmingham but there was some paperwork issues with legal between UA legal and legal from Jefferson County and they couldn't get the paperwork done fast enough for me to really legally be there and I, I kind of got annoyed and asked if I could just be placed somewhere else so that I could start on time with everybody else and finish on time so I ended up getting paired up with somebody and um, was at the student health center at Alabama which I don't regret that at all. I just wish that I had had the opportunity to have the WIC exposure like others were able to get um, because what I do now, it would have come in a little bit more handy. And especially when you're taking exit exams and community nutrition exams and they're asking questions about WIC and all you really know about it is from what you've learned in your uh, textbooks. So that's kind of the only thing I really feel like I missed out on. Another question, if you could do it over, would you pick the same internship program? Well, given the situation that I was in, it was the ideal situation. The fact that Alabama let me into their master's program, allowed me to continue in the master's program while working on the undergrad classes, and then the timing of being able to apply for that program and then finish it in the time. I just, it all just, the pieces just came together. I don't think that if I had decided to go anywhere else, that my life would be any different as far as the type of dietitian I feel that I am. I don't think that is the case. Um, I just think I was just going off of gut and instinct of this is all falling into place, so this has to be the right thing for me. And I feel like it all really worked out. Another question, after passing the RD exam, did you already have a job lined up or did you need to search for a while? Or did you go straight from your RD exam to working on your PhD? I went straight from finishing my master's to going right into my PhD program. So I did non-thesis research for my master's and through that experience of working with my mentors, they saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see as far as my knack and ability to manage a research study from start to finish and go through the IRB. I went through the IRB process pretty seamlessly with that project that I was working on. And it just so happened that that TA that I had made mad a couple years earlier was graduating and her TA position was opening. So they offered me that spot. And at first I said no, because I didn't understand what exactly they were, <laughs> what opportunity they were really giving me. I was like, oh, I just don't want to be like a random TA for 20 hours a week making not that much money. I didn't really understand what they were offering. So I remember I went back to my office at Bryant Denny Stadium that day and mentioned it to one of my coworkers and they were like, oh wait, I got a real like t teaching assistantship. Like don't they pay for your PhD and then they give you a monthly stipend and they give you, and at that time you got health insurance. And I was like, wait, what? They pay for the PhD? Because in my head I thought I still had to pay for everything. So I sent an email over to that uh, professor and she told me later on that the second she saw my email pop up and it said, like, I thought about it a little bit and I think I need some more information. She joked to herself, like she said, ha ha ha, got her. Like, we're going to get her. They really wanted me to have that position and to be in the Ph.D. program because they knew that I would do well and I needed that that kind of push. So I decided to just go straight into that. So this was back when Alabama didn't have a nutrition PhD program. The PhD program is actually housed across the hall 
over in health sciences. So my PhD is in health education and health promotion. But I had like a concentration in nutrition since I was coming from a nutrition background. So I took the RD exam actually in November of that like first fall semester of my PhD. I, I took fall break to study nonstop and then took the exam on that Saturday. Um, so I didn't become an RD until almost the end of the first semester of my PhD. But so when I was filling out these surveys, like these alumni surveys of like, are you currently working? And it's like, well, yeah, but it's, I don't feel like this is a real job. Like I never really felt like I was working as a dietitian, being in education because I was just teaching classes, taking more classes. I wasn't seeing patients or working with the community in a certain way for at first. And then when I started teaching the nutrition education course and doing more with Head Start schools and teaching my students how to teach little ones nutrition, that's where I started to feel like more of an RD. Uh, but I didn't actually do any of my own clinical practice until after my PhD. So the next question, how long did it take for you to complete your doctorate? I did it in four years in a summer. Traditionally, it would have taken three years, but because I wasn't coming from a health education, health theory background, the advisors of the PhD program thought it would be best for me to take an extra year to take some of the master's levels courses that a lot of the PhD students would have already taken. And I just remember taking those that first like fall and like blowing those classes out of the water to where the advisors were like, yeah, we're sorry, we made a mistake. Like you didn't need to sit through these classes. Like you definitely know theory better than we thought and you know this and that better than we thought. So it's not that I took an extra year and it was a waste. I, it allowed, it gave me more time to really think about what I wanted to do for my research. It allowed me to start taking statistics to where I was able to take more statistics classes throughout my PhD because I had that extra year. My assistantship, the way that they had it set up, it was, I had a little bit of freedom in the time that it would take me to finish. I was pretty much told like, if you finish within a reasonable time, you can have your TA position the entire time as opposed to the students who had their assistantships on the health science side, teaching classes in that department, theirs were very strict three-year only TA positions. So I was fortunate that I was able to kind of take the extra, the extra semester that I needed to finish my research and get it all done. So when I finished my doctorate, I did not have a job right away. And I, it was not for a lack of trying at all. I uh, definitely put the work in. I did some interviews and didn't work out. And I'm, I'm glad they didn't work out because I don't think I would have been happy at those institutions. I think I got two on-site interviews before I graduated. And so the folks at Alabama were just so gracious in letting me be an adjunct instructor for some online classes. And then they needed a full-time advisor uh, to help advise the freshmen and the sophomores. So I was able to do that that fall semester while continuing to search for academic positions because I knew I wanted to be a professor and a researcher. That's what I wanted to do. That was the whole intention throughout my PhD program. It was never, in, I was never intending to go back into industry in any way. So I ended up, so in January of 2018, I had three interviews, three weeks in a row, LSU included in that. And I got all three of those jobs. I was offered positions um, from all of them. LSU was the first that offered and they made the best offer. And it was the offer that made the most sense because it was the closest university to where we were in Alabama. So that the transition period from going from Alabama down to Louisiana, my husband needed extra time uh, to vacate his position and then find a position here. And it just all worked out. Um, I don't think we would have been comfortable in California and I don't think we would have been comfortable um, at the other in the other city that um, the university was located in. So why did I decide to go into teaching? Well, I like teaching. I think it's really fun. I like I like being the person that kind of help someone realize that they can do 
something they maybe didn't think they could before. I like to see the growth from freshman through sophomore year of students really coming together and, and putting everything together into a package and then and applying to internships and, and going off and, and doing well. Um, my husband has always been supportive of my efforts. Um, he was very supportive of me doing my PhD and going into teaching. I think he thinks it suits me. Uh, here are some pictures of him. So Pat Node is actually my maiden name, which my students prior to LSU uh, could never spell my last name. So I definitely have one now that it's a lot easier on students. But now that I'm here in Louisiana, that last name, the Pat Node name, y'all could, could pronounce it now. Um, I'm in an area of the country where no one has an issue with, with last names that are spelled like that. But my husband and I have been together since 2010. We met the second day I moved to Alabama. And we have been together ever since. And we got married in 2016. So I planned my own wedding instead of writing my dissertation proposal that summer. <laughs> Not the best idea, but it all worked out. But my husband is a tattoo artist, and he's actually going to be on the podcast with me for an episode at some point this fall to talk about what he does and how that inter intersects with um, people in their careers and, and having uh, tattoos and whatnot. So look forward to that. So I also do research in addition to teaching. So these are different photos of me throughout the years at FENCI and APHA presenting research. All of my research is based in breastfeeding and that's kind of the simple way of saying it. Um, I like to look more at how women and parents think about breastfeeding. So why they're making the decision to choose to feed their child a certain way and really kind of looking at all of the environmental factors that go into that decision-making process and then what they are doing to either persevere or why are they not um, able to be successful. So I really love this aspect. Being a director of a program doesn't give me as much time to focus on research, but I'm getting better at that. And I have some really exciting stuff with COVID that I'm working on right now that I think is going to be really amazing to present to people in the future. So, oh, these are my, this is like the first senior class that I had from start to finish. And they're just amazing. Some people are missing from this photo, but I always like to joke that I was built by Bama, but I'm here to make more champions. And it's just so convenient that I think my time working with LSU, I'm sorry, Alabama football and the different uh, sports programs. I think I have close to eight national championships between football, softball, and gymnastics uh, under my belt while I was working with them. And then I come here and within two years, LSU wins a football championship. So I think I'm, I have some sort of, um, some sort of energy I'm putting out there that's helping with that. So built by Bama, but making more champions at LSU. So another question I have, as a dietitian, what are the benefits of having a PhD versus having a master's degree? So if you want to teach at the university level, you can do so with a master's. Um, you'll just only be able to teach undergrad. But if you want to teach graduate school and be working on research with grad students, you need to have a PhD. Uh, if you want to run a program that has a master's component to it, such as like a, a DVD master's program or an or a, um, MSDI program, you, you have to have a, a doctorate. Um, just it's always being one level above whatever it is that you're teaching. So there are benefits if you want to work in academia. If you want to bring a doctorate out into clinical practice, it's more of a clinical doctorate. And there are programs across the U.S. that you can do where it's more focused on less about completing research in the PhD traditional sense in, and more honing in your clinical skills so that you can bring that back out into practice. So yes, we are now requiring students to obtain master's degrees. It's only going to make you a better dietitian in the long run, but I don't necessarily advise that students 
go off and also get a clinical doctorate or a PhD unless you really feel that that's what you need to take yourself to the next level. So if you want to be in academia, you want to be a researcher, you want to be a professor, PhD is going to be the obvious choice. And then if you're in clinical practice for a little while or other types of practice and you really feel that that doctorate degree is going to advance your career significantly, whether it's in a position or with your salary, I certainly encourage that. Uh, but we will never get to the point where you will have I say this, I say never, but who knows? I don't think in the next 10 to 20 years that our industry and our profession will require people to get doctorate degrees in order to, to be a dietitian. I don't think they'll take it this far. There's enough backlash about the master's requirement um, causing a lot of problems. And um, that would only be, you know, exemplified through trying to, uh, tell people that they have to also get a doctorate. That's a lot. That is a lot. So do I feel working in a university setting provides me with a greater work-life balance versus a dietitian working in clinical or community? I honestly don't know. I have a really weird work-life balance that I need to work on. I can't, I'm definitely not the expert in the work-life balance. Um, there are some days I think I have it all under control. Uh, I don't have children, so I don't have the experience of that element. So I definitely feel like I need to do a podcast with the, with either someone in academia um, and, or other dietitians that have children. I've never worked 100% full-time in clinical or community. Right after I graduated, um, when I was doing stuff with UA in between getting this job at LSU, I was a subcontractor doing a little bit of outpatient work in uh, cardiac rehab and that was only four days a month but they were full days of all outpatient but I wasn't bedside like I had been trained in my internship so I really can't say that one it's going to give you that flexibility or the other plus everyone's lives are different if you choose not to have kids that eliminates one of the major things that work-life balance is, is important for um, and then depending on what exactly you do in your position. And then if you uh, have a, a partner or a spouse and, and what they do and their hours, that also gets factored in to that as well. So I think that's just going to create a really good podcast episode uh, for me to find some folks to really talk about that. So that's just a little bit about me probably talk too long, but my plan is to have every Sunday new episodes of the podcast. So these first few episodes are going to be with dietetic internships, talking to some program directors, students getting their questions answered. If you have any inquiries about this podcast, you can send me an email at emckinley1 at lsu.edu. I'm definitely open to others who may want to come on the show and talk about their experience. I already have a list of ideas of program topics that I would like to talk about. Um, I tend to focus on what's really hot on the listservs in the different practice groups for dietitians to really see what, what people are talking about with regard to student success in any any uh, any phase of this. So if you're interested in coming on and doing a podcast, shoot me an email. We can figure it out. Uh, but thank you for spending some time with me. And I hope that you'll tune in. And the next episode will be debuting next week with McNeese University. Thanks, y'all.